Thank you so much, Dr. Emmons, Dr. King, and thank you, Hannah, so much for, uh, for these, these amazing presentations and responses today. Dr. Emmons, I just wanted to give you a minute uh, or two to respond to anything that um, has been uh, uh, caused for you to think from Dr. King or Hannah. Well, uh, tough to do that in a minute or two. I mean, the, the power and the provocativeness and the persuasiveness of those presentations was just, I mean, overwhelming. Uh, and Brad and everyone else uh, really appreciate uh, the depth of your comments. Um, uh, Hannah, I was especially uh, grateful that you mentioned Brother David Stondorast. Uh, he's like my hero, my gratitude guru and mentor and hero. Uh, I've learned more about gratitude from uh, Brother David than anyone else, you know, uh, I've had the fortune of meeting him uh, and uh, hanging out with him a few times. He's like, I think he just turned 96 in uh, July of uh, 95. He'll be 96 this year in July. And if I was going to uh, recommend like one book for anyone to read about gratitude, especially in the context of spiritual practices and prayer, it would be Brother David's book which I just happen to have right here. <laughs> uh, gratefulness, the heart of prayer. Uh, that's, I recommend this book more than any other one if you want to learn about you know, the spiritual foundations of gratefulness. And he's done more to uh, facilitate interreligious dialogue than anyone else as well. But anyway, but yeah, I mean, the whole notion that gratitude just uh, wells up within us and it cries for expression, as you so pointedly demonstrated. Uh, and, you know, there's really no way to capture that in empirical science. You know, it just comes up so short. And I, I just feel so humbled when I, when I, you know, hear people like you talking about the personal meaning and power of gratitude and just what a disconnect there is and how frustrated I am that the science can't really get at that. You know, yeah, we can, you know, develop this measure and ask people about that and, you know, look at this uh, effect in their lives. But just what, what you hear in the, you know, in the therapy room, uh, just, you know, what, uh, you know, what pastors hear, you know, in their congregations and counseling, it just goes so far beyond, you know, what we can do as empirical scientists. And that, that's, I mean, that's integration for me. You know, that's when I think about gratitude at so many different levels and layers and involving perspectives that come from the, you know, using the tools and techniques of modern science to, to shed light on something that's just so deeply and personally powerful as gratefulness. So I appreciate the comments of both of you. And so here's a question for you. So what do you think about, uh, you've done a lot of work with, of course, adolescents, young adults and so forth. Uh, and, you know, your work on spiritual exemplars, uh, mm -hmm. I've always thought of exemplary, you know, research, pun intended. Um, do you find that they, they talk um, about gratitude? Does, does it come up as a theme uh, or not? I mean, to me, this, this goes beyond that. It really is about, you know, one of the questions I get most often uh, from like parents is how can I get so-and-so to become more grateful? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a spouse. Usually it's a child, most <laughs> often a teenager or adolescent, you know, and, you know, you have adolescents. I had them now they're 21 and 25. So they're beyond that stage. But, you know, it, it, do you think gratitude is something that comes easily or naturally to people of this age group or going through these, you know, life stages or is it something which really is, is more of a challenge? And if so, uh, we need to approach it maybe differently than we would our own, you know, uh, spiritual growth and gratitude. Mm -hmm. Bob, I wish I could like pull quotes out of the top of my head, and I haven't <laughs> put in those transcripts real, real recently. But one thing um, I will suspect is that um, with exemplar adolescents, it's a really unique group. Um, so we're looking at more of an idealized teleological version of what we're looking for. But yeah. I'm going to suspect it was because these young people were so able to clearly articulate like a giver. They were very clear on yeah. a source of where, 
of where life was coming from. And it was an extremely diverse group of adolescents, um, different belief systems, whether they were Sikh or atheist, um, Christian, Jewish, um, and they had such a profound awareness and appreciation for life around them. These were kids who could really see meaning in typical things. Um, they were very clear also that their faith gave them purpose um, in how they lived their life. So I, I'm going to go back and look, but I'm, I'm guessing that they would, but they weren't typical kids. But from a developmental perspective, um, and I'm so curious about our Shades of Gratitude project, that it seems that for those younger that have a more anthropomorphized understanding of whatever the cosmic giver is, that more concrete and more human-like uh, imagination seems to be easier for young people to, to access and, and be aware of. Um, I don't know that kids in general make the attribution of the gift um, as being connected to the giver as we might, but they seem to be able to identify that there is where. So I think helping make people, helping kids make that connection between the gift and the giver, even if it is the, the, the beads from my aunt um, and, and God gave me my aunt to help kids connect those dots developmentally is really important in terms of Mary Helen Mordino Yang at USC does a lot of interesting research on how those more abstract beliefs become internalized for children and adolescents. Great, great, thank you. Thank you so much. I want to um, jump in here and get us into the questions. And I want to actually, I think, summarize a theme that's emerging in a, a number of the questions and Hannah that I think you so beautifully brought up. And that is, what is what do we know cross-culturally about gratitude? Um, and earlier, Bobby talked about moving from thin understandings of gratitude to a thicker understanding of gratitude, which, of course, not only includes like um, gratitude situated within particular religious context, but but situated with a particular cultural context. And for example, the difference between an individualistic culture and a collectivist culture. So I'm wondering if any one, any three of the three of you can talk a little bit about that, what we know about gratitude related to cultural differences. Sure. Uh, I'll just take a stab at it. Um, a few ideas off the top of my head. And I know there are you know, a good handful of studies that have you know, explicitly tried to look at uh, both differences, but also as a cultural phenomenon. So, I mean, just perspective of, you know, religious traditions we have. So we can think of gratitude as something which is embedded in traditions, but also transcends traditions. Uh, so there are elements of it that, you know, gratitude receives particular uh, form and context within a tradition, but there are elements which transcend those as well. So, you know, I, I, I believe this is the case, and I've argued this for as long as I've studied gratitude, that the, it really is a human universal that it's something that has something very specific about who we are and, and what we need in terms of relationships. And, and as I mentioned today, uh, in terms of constructing an identity as us as receivers, but also as givers. And I think that's pretty much, if it's not universal, it's certainly cross-culturally recurrent. Uh, I think, you know, one could make that case and, and defend that uh, perspective. Now, the particular ways in which that's played out in terms of the giving, receiving of gifts and norms and practices within it, each of those locations, right, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be different, obviously. I mean, it has to be. You'd be shocked if it was all the same, right? So the meaning may be different, the expression is different, the degree to which, you know, gratitude co-occurs with, you know, obligation or indebtedness, as Hannah beautifully pointed out, the degree to which that indebtedness is seen as pleasant or as unpleasant, do can we tolerate that debtedness? Do we like that? Do we like feeling, you know, indebted? Because that, you know, makes us closer to the giver, uh, to the benefactor. Or is that something we want to discharge as soon as possible? Uh, that's a very different uh, valence to it. I think, you know, that can differ in terms of a person's culture and worldview, uh, and so on. So, yeah, that's that's an easy way out, right? To say that there's universal as well as local uh, <laughs> components to it. But room for more research in that area, I'm hearing. <laughs> More research is needed, as they say. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Fred, can I throw in something there? Please. Uh, again, I'll point to Mary Helen and Mordino Yang's research, who's looked at expression of motion um, cross-culturally and also gene size at Stanford, um, that different 
cultural, we become, we, ex, we might express emotions differently, but we've got the similar stuff going on in our brain. Um, so we need to understand what our normative expressions and behaviors, as Bob was speaking about. A hypothesis I have that I would like to be able to study as we unpack the varying degrees um, aspects of gratitude to God is that the reference or the giver, um, I would hypothesize that the more sacred or more special or more powerful the referent is, uh, the more potentially agentic. Um, so if God is deemed as powerful or good um, and loving, or whether it is science, if I have a different worldview, or if I might come from a culture that has more a, a different ontology about the connection of all of humanity and somehow that is working um, towards giving gifts, that these different views, beliefs, um, it might be the extent to which they are deemed sacred, important, or meaningful might impact how much the meaning of the gift means. Um, so there could be totally different worldviews, but it might have more to do with how important they are, how much, how much bearing they bring um, on a person's life. I think what I've sort of experienced in my personal life and as well as what I've seen in my clients is it's hard to tease out where kind of one starts and ends. Um, so like the gratitude and the indebtedness component, um, you know, like literally on Tuesday, a client was weeping both out of pain from her family of origin, but also it was just enriched with gratitude. And we were sort of looking at that and, you know, um, yeah, so it is hard to kind of tease out where those begin at least for me, and I think it's been modeled, um, at least in my family. Um, Great, thank you. It's hard to imagine. Uh, there's a sociologist that uh, is quoted from time to time in the, in the literature on gratitude, especially when it's interdisciplinary work, who said something like, "You know, just uh, just try to imagine uh, a society without gratitude or relationships without gratitude, mm -hmm. right? What would cause those relationships to?" you know, persist and endure over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, would it just be pure contracts, right? Would it just be, you know, uh, it, it wouldn't be the, 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 um, the, the emotional uh, aspect of it that oils the wheels of reciprocity, right? We would have a contract, we would have, again, as I mentioned before, it's like, if, if I was gonna give you a gift and I said, okay, this is what I wanna return, uh, where, where's gratitude in that? Gratitude no longer plays a role in that. So, I mean, relationships and society would just would just crumble. It, it would just fall apart. I mean, try to imagine yourself without something that you're grateful for or someone you're grateful to or an experience that you're grateful for, right? Just try just imagine the absence of gratitude. What would life be like? I, I don't know. I, I can't do that mental work. <laughs> but, you know, try, try to imagine love. Somebody yesterday asked the question about love and gratitude, which is a great question, and I don't have an answer for that. I think, you know, that love is the greatest gift uh, and that we're grateful for receiving the gift of love. So, you know, gratitude works that way. But try to imagine, think of a loving relationship and then think about loving that person. Then think about being grateful for that person. It strikes me that's a different feeling, okay? Because then you would you would treat that person differently because you perceive that they, they don't have to be there. What would my life be like, you know, without my wife, for example, right? or without someone else uh, that I dearly love. It would be a very different kind of relationship and I would treat that relationship differently, being grateful for it as a gift that I'm not entitled to or not deserving of. So, um, you know, again, I think this is a kind of basic response, even though gratitude is not uh, a basic emotion, as Pam said, it's, it's more than a feeling. There's something very, very universal about it that says something very deeply about who we are as human beings. Great. Well, let me ask you to imagine, you imagine something, Bob, and the rest of you <laughs> in the questions here, or the question is actually worded, could you tell us something about how gratitude relates to humility? Yeah, uh, excellent. So I think there are a number of capacities that make it possible to become a grateful person, okay? not just to experience gratitude momentarily as a response to receiving a gift, but also, I mean, more, more broadly uh, and more enduringly as a basic disposition or, or virtue as uh, Pam has used the language. So, I mean, how can you be grateful uh, without being aware of your need, your dependency, 
right? To, I mean, humility is being able to accept a gift, right? And, and saying, I can't do this all by myself. Uh, I can't uh, bring about all the things I need to have brought about, right? I need help. I need assistance. I, I recognize myself as a dependent being upon others, doing things for me that I can't do for myself. And so I think, you know, and Brother David talks about this in his book, actually, right here on my desk, about how, you know, humility is the basis for gratitude. It really starts there. So just to be open to the contributions of others and realizing that, you know, I didn't do it all by myself. And one of the reasons why I mentioned yesterday, I think gratitude is countercultural because so much pressure tells us, no, you've got to do it on your own. You've got to take credit for your success, right? Our, our, our identity is based on our performance. It's based on our accomplishments, you know, not who I am, but what I do. Who I am is based on what I do and my successes, right? And all the approval and attention and affection I get from other people. It's not based on the gifts that I've received. It's based on my own accomplishments, and so we're, you know, that sounds like a definite lack of humility in those cases. And so, yeah, I think there's, there's at least five qualities that are necessary for gratitude to persist and endure and for us to grow in gratitude. Humility is one of those, right? I think the capacity for redemption, to go from the bad to the good. Can anything good come out of something bad? Right. And we talked about this yesterday in terms of suffering, in terms of extracting, you know, benefit from a terrible experience. So that's necessary. Uh, a sense of identity, which is what I tried to move toward today in my thinking about just us as grateful people, how that's necessary for us to live uh, gratefully. Um, so I don't want to go through all five of them. I'll take up all the time. But yeah, humility, I think, is right at the core of what's needed to be a grateful person. Great. Hannah or Pam? Yeah, I'll elaborate on the coordinates idea of this um, navigational system that the cognitive appraisals that we voluntarily or involuntarily make in gratitude, I think help us locate ourselves in the in the cosmic world, and it it, it triggers an opportunity to have that right perspective of who we are. Um, that is something that we often talk about with humility is having that right perspective. So it connects me to God, the giver, the creator of life. It puts my dependency, as Bob said, on the table. It's a gentle reminder, or it's an invitation to be reminded of this. But it's also very important that um, self-reflection in and of itself or in a vacuum is not enough for that coordinate system. That there is, you know, the gospel narrative, there are other, there are coordinates out there uh, that different people ascribe to, and that how important, as you've been talking about thin or thick understandings of gratitude, we need to hold, like, as Christians, scripture, um, theology, our, our beliefs, our sacred writings, um, in concert with that reflection, so that we are, we are directing with the right coordinates in mind, and humility is something that gets prompted um, easily in that process. Yes, yes. There's a, um, you know, I think of humility as having a proper perspective of oneself, mm -hmm. you know, uh, one's talents, one's ability. So not just being the receiver of gifts, but also the giver of gifts, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we, we find ourselves, I think as Miroslav Volf, who um, Rebecca mentioned yesterday, so his work on joy, uh, has talked about humans as being kind of finding ourselves midstream in the flow of gifts, right? We receive gifts, you know, from God, from others. We then give gifts back, right, to God and to others. And so they don't, they don't end with us, you know, they don't start with us, but we are we're kind of like in that middle, midstream of gifts. And that's part of the, part of the identity of oneself as a receiver, as well as a giver. And I think humility gives us a proper perspective on that. Hannah, did you want to chip in on something on humility? No, I was just going to align with all, <laughs> all of those. I think it just reminds us that we're not doing this on our own, it really counteracts yes. the individualistic mindset and that we are all relating with each other. Like we can't exist on our own. I think the, uh, you know, the pandemic, if it's done anything, it's reminded us of that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, how many, how many virtues have been, you know, uh, have been amplified uh, in the past couple of years? You know, one of those, I think, it is a sense of gratitude, right, for, for, uh, for medicine, for uh, pharmaceuticals, for healthcare providers, for you know, supply chain, you know, people and processes, you know, that make it possible for us to, you know, survive and to get on with life through everything we've gone through. And 
uh, I, I think I've seen a few studies showing that gratitude levels have increased uh, in the past couple of years. So it's, uh, uh, you know, kind of a naturalistic laboratory where we, you know, or we, we, we've had things taken away from us that we otherwise would have been very grateful for. We didn't realize how much we depended upon these things, uh, like seeing colleagues in person instead of over the screens, uh, for example. <laughs> what a great thing it was that uh, we could actually get together again. Hopefully, you'll be able to get together again down there in Fuller pretty soon. Um, you know, there are things that happen that will raise our levels of gratitude that happen naturally. And, uh, and so we can all learn from those and experience those in a more grateful way. Yeah. Here's an interesting question. Um, how can we think about gratitude in relation to justice? If gratitude mm -hmm. is an appropriate response to a gift, can we say that we owe gratitude? Is failing to show gratitude a, an injustice? Well, I know there's various thoughts on that and streams of thought from people who have written about this and thought about it for a long time. Uh, I mean, I would come out on the side and say, yes, uh, I think so. Um, one of the things I mentioned yesterday was that even if we don't feel grateful, we need to express because it's the right thing to do. So there are justice-based or juridical reasons for expressing gratitude because, you know, it's owed to that person who's gone out of their way to do something for us, uh, to help us, and we perceive benevolence. So we were want to respond in a proper um, degree based upon the, you know, the cost involved and their intention, all of those things that make it a, an occasion for gratitude. Um, and yeah, I think, I think the question is whether we see ourselves as the debtor or not, whether we see ourselves as gladly indebted or as something which is painful and we want to remove as, as quickly as possible. Um, then there's the issue of what if we don't actually get a gift? but the person has intended to bend them, do we still owe the person gratitude then? You know, somebody, uh, they say, okay, I'll, I'll uh, offer to help you get a job. And then, you know, it does, it falls through and we don't get the, so we don't actually get the benefit, but we still owe that person thanks, right? Because they tried the extended effort on our behalf. What if we don't like the gift? Right. How many have gotten, you know, Christmas presents, birthday presents that were horrible, right? That, you know, wasn't the right thing. And that, um, but yeah, we still owe the giver thanks because it was their intention, which we are grateful for. We're grateful for their graciousness as opposed to the thing itself. So yeah, I, I think it's owed in those cases. I think it makes sense to talk about it as, um, as a debt that we want to discharge in, in a proper way. Uh, at the right time and proper degree, which is what makes gratitude a virtue. Mm. I'd also offer, um, and this is where the teleological perspective for me is really helpful, that human thriving has to be tied to a flourishing world. Um, mm -hmm. So even if we think theologically about conservation and all of creation being brought to completion, um, and in this era when we're much more highly attuned to the fragility of our planet, that if our thriving, what feels like thriving to us, is a cost for marginalized persons or our planet um, or results in injustice for others, that's not actual thriving. So that gratitude in its ultimate sense needs to attune us to what is just. And that will adapt over time. Like we didn't realize in the 70s that we needed to attune to issues around our planet. We have a slight heightened sensitivity um, to race and racism in this era. Um, the pandemic has heightened um, our connection to one another and heightened this obligation. And so gratitude, I think, in its thickest conceptualization needs to have this like eschatological perspective and global perspective of how does my version of what matters of what I'm most grateful for, how does that align and propel me in a way that is contributing um, to the greater good and to God's um, work in this world. Great, great. I want to ask another question um, personally here, because I'm thinking of, but that there must be some pastors and practical theologians on this call, um, and they've been hearing you talk about developing gratitude. Um, and if we go back to what Dr. Yang said yesterday about the place of worship and communal practices, maybe with even within, if we think specifically within faith traditions, and we can also again bring back the collectivist question here around collectivist cultures. I'm wondering, and Pam, again, your work around the, and what Rebecca said, 
meaning making narratives of gratitude. I'm wondering if you, you three could just um, vamp for a second on what's the role of a religious community in creating narratives of gratitude? What would you say to a pastor or someone in a ministry context who's trying to figure out how to make this useful to their community? Or what have you seen that's been useful? Yeah. I'll take a stab at it first. Uh, I think uh, the big distinction that I have seen, and I think it's really important, uh, probably not an original observation, but when gratitude, and I was trying to allude to this toward the end of my presentation, when gratitude is kind of divorced from a larger context, mm -hmm. uh, it ceases to be, I think, uh, an effective spiritual way of being in the world. So when gratitude becomes an end in itself or an end to other ends, so here's a strategy or tactic for becoming happier, healthier, your relationships will improve, you know, uh, people will like you better, or, you know, you, you will tithe more. So we want to increase gratitude because people will become more generous in the congregation or grateful patients will give more to the hospitals and so on. Now, it doesn't work, right? Because we know, and the pastors who know this, and uh, the ones I've talked to know this, and, and we'll talk quite a lot about this, how about how you, know, you, can, you can get people to change their behavior based on guilt, uh, but they won't, they won't be motivated for very long, right? So you can, you know, so guilt is not a great motivator for change, but grace is, okay? So it seems to me, from my own experience in the churches that I've attended, uh, the ones where I felt the most gratitude uh, to God, as, to, as well as to others, don't even talk about gratitude that much, right? The focus is on God's goodness, God's greatness, mm -hmm. God's graciousness. If I focus on the greatness of God, what God has done for me, what God has done for all of us, mm -hmm. then gratitude naturally flows from that. It doesn't have to be a focus in and of itself, right? And so um, well, I focus on you know, the bigger context, maybe this is what John Edwards meant by the, the supernatural versus natural gratitude, just who God is and what God has done. Uh, gratitude is the natural response to that. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, techniques are not useful, that, you know, small groups that focus on gratitude journaling or gratitude accountability, that, I think that's all useful. It's all good. It all has its place. But I don't think that's the starting or ending point. I think it starts and ends with God's love and God's goodness. Great, great. I know. Would you like to say something? I, I was just going to mention that in the Korean church, what I've seen is this. So there's this thing of Han where there's this collective unconscious, this collective pain. And um, sometimes when, you know, when we wail out of that kind of pain, there isn't fully words that can capture what it is that we're in pain about. Mm -hmm. And so this type of like early morning prayer that I was mentioning, um, I think, again, there was a sense of kind of wailing together in that communal space. And that, that sort of fed this sense of, at least that's what I've seen and felt is that they've fed this sense of gratitude that, oh, I don't, this wailing as embarrassing as it feels, I'm not doing it alone and other people can understand without me fully like identifying what words, you know. Um, and so I think it's just kind of unspoken, that feeling um, that and that's why I like that with spirit when I'm talking about this is because it's just felt. Great, thank you. And I, I, I love that. I was gonna say that we need inclusive narratives around gratitude. So there we're not just grateful for what is for me, but grateful for what propels the we of broader society. Um, and I love that this word that doesn't have a specific meaning is something that people can communally participate in um, that is inclusive and that we can all voice this lament um, in unison and, and it can be spoken for others as well. And I think if I were working with the church, working with the church, I would want to encourage a church to be able to voice gratitude or voice lament for those things that are lost or grief communally, which is not something Protestants do as well. And also to reinforce prayers of what not I am grateful, but what we are grateful for and how those things move us towards a more just and whole society. Wonderful. Well, we're at the end here. So let me thank you again, uh, Bob and Pam and Hannah. Thank you so much.